Well, hello, everybody. My name is Jerry Brackley. I'm the Director of Marketing at HostBridge Technology. I want to thank all of you for being here today. And we're going to spend our time together in a technical presentation where we will do some coding. When I say we, I really mean my colleague, James Alexander, who I'll turn uh, the presentation over to in just a minute. But we appreciate your presence. And I want to assure everyone we are recording our session today. And we welcome your questions and interaction and your comments. So I'm sure everyone's been in a year or two of virtual meetings already, but all you have to do is send us a message in the chat. I will be monitoring that during our session today. We will get your questions and comments in front of James as we go through this presentation and demonstration of how you create a Kix API. So let's move right into our presentation. And just very briefly to let you know that HostBridge has been around for a while and we have customers around the globe. A great many of them are in the three industries listed here, banking, insurance, manufacturing, and logistics. But we have many other customers in other industries as well. Uh, it's our pleasure to work with customers to help them figure out how to make their CICS application portfolio available. It's what we do and have done for two decades. There, there are really two main focuses that we have as a company. On the left of the screen, you can see that we have an integration analytics practice. And we are delighted to talk to you about this. We won't spend much time today going through integration analytics, but we have learned over the last few years, the analytics work we're doing to help organizations understand what is driving their kicks activity on the mainframe has become critical to helping them achieve better performing integrations and really provide a roadmap for modernization. On the right side of the screen, this has been our core business for over 20 years. And that's really where we'll focus today. The demonstration James will do will show you how we use our JavaScript engine to create these APIs. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to James. Thanks, Jerry. I assume you can hear me okay? All right, good. Uh, Housebridge does the hard stuff. We don't, we don't do the easy stuff. It's easy to take a common area program running inside of CICS or a channels container program and running inside of CICS and, and turn that into a callable service. Uh, but it's hard to take digital transactions. Transactions are only meant to run at a terminal and take a business process that's running in that environment and turn it into a callable service without making any changes to the application on the host. No changes to the application on the host and we're not doing screen scraping. So easy stuff, we do that too. I don't wanna, I don't wanna leave it out. We do that too, but we also do the hard stuff. When you've got hard integration, you've gotta to do to, to CICS on the host, we're, we're your solution. <laughs> HostBridge runs and resides entirely inside of CICS. By the way, this is my last slide, and I want to start writing code. Uh, HostBridge runs and resides entirely on the host inside of CICS. So when you see me uh, call JavaScript here in a few minutes, when you see me write JavaScript code, that's running inside of Kix, inside CICS. We ported a JavaScript engine uh, 10, 12 years ago, long before Node was popular, uh, to run inside of CICS, a server-side JavaScript engine. This allows us to interact with those applications uh, as if we're, and we are, a, a native CICS application. We can call all the CICS APIs. We can interact with all the transactions, call programs, all those things directly inside of CICS writing JavaScript. We're able to do this integration of these transactions and be able to use real field names when accessing the data that's on the screen. The data on the screen, we can pull and, and access by a field name, not by screen geometry. How do we do this? Well, there's metadata that's in part of the CICS transaction, uh, whether it's BMS maps or uh, whether it's the CA version of BMS maps or CA ideal, there's metadata that's very often that's associated with these transactions and screens. Um, and that metadata actually gives us those field names dynamically on the fly without any pre setup. 
So when you install HostBridge in your environment, you immediately get access to these field names. You can immediately begin writing your integration scripts. When you're doing screen scraping normally, you have multiple, multiple requests fly up to the host and then multiple response, one for, each, one for each screen, right? And you're pulling data by screen geometry. With HostBridge, you'll send one request to the host. HostBridge, the JavaScript engine running inside of CICS will do all the interactions with the applications and send back a single response. So if you've got a business process like a change address that might take five, six, or seven screens to walk through, you know, start the application, find your customer, um, navigate to the change address screen, change the address, confirm the change, then back out again. We can do that in a single request to the host. So one request up to the host, we interact with that transaction, and then one response back. The application on the host, it still thinks it's running at a terminal, but there's no VTAM, there's no terminal involved. We're able to invoke those transactions at a lower level, and so, the 3270 data stream is never being built. We're getting that data before that happens. Okay, so we're gonna go right to the code. Uh, this is kind of a high wire act. And by that, I mean, um, I'm gonna write live code in front of you from a clean sheet. And um, the only cut and paste I'll do is from one of our tools that I'm gonna be showing you, one of our beta tools, uh, but everything else is just live, live code. Uh, you'll understand exactly what I'm doing because it's one step at a time. All right. So let's first take a look at the application I'm gonna be integrating with. So I'm gonna fire up my CICS application so we can take a look at it. And the transaction I'm gonna be running is called TRAD. Now this is a sample application written by IBM, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, uh, probably by some junior IBM programmer someplace. And it's a real simple application. It's got uh, four stocks in a stock portfolio and, uh, in each one of the stocks, you can buy, sell, or get real-time quote of the stock. Now, I did modify this application just because it was another feature of HostBridge I wanted to display. And I'm sorry that my, my Zoom uh, control is, is, is getting in the way of things. I, I tried hiding it earlier and was unsuccessful. I'll drop it down here for now. Um, but I can, this, the, the application allows me to um, buy, sell stock, like I said, but I wanted to show another feature of HostBridge that we haven't talked about and I haven't mentioned. Not only can you call into HostBridge running inside of CICS, but HostBridge running inside of CICS can make outbound, outbound calls to anything that's got a, um, a, a web service API. So in this case, I just want to show you that I can go out and get real-time weather. Oh, I hit the wrong, wrong key. I'll try that again. Get real-time weather from, I think it's weather.com uh, weather is where I'm getting this data from. So I'm going to put in a zip code for New York City. Now, this is live data. I can actually put a zip code in and get this, these elements of data faster than you can by navigating to the, to the page. Now, obviously, most applications aren't going to need um, weather data inside their application, but they do need to integrate with the outside world. They do need to be able to either push data out of the host or applications, which is what I'm going to be showing you mostly today, reaching into the host and pulling data out. But we can also go out and get data from the host. Now, this is a standard COBOL program that you're seeing, and it does a standard link to host bridge and passes um, uh, uh, just a, a zip code in a com area or in a channels containers in this case. And then HostBridge pulls that out, makes an outbound call to weather.com, gets back a JSON document, it parses the JSON document and passes it back to the standard COBOL program. The COBOL program knows nothing about the internet, it knows nothing about um, a JSON. All it's doing is just linking to HostBridge, the JavaScript engine, and we're doing all the heavy lifting for them. And one last one, this is, this is where I'm currently located at today. So very, very fast pushing data out of the host, pulling data into the host, either direction. All right, let's look at the rest of this application because this is what we're going to do the integration against. Um, I'm going to pick KC Import Export as my, as my first uh, stock, and I'm going to pick real-time quote. And I logged in as myself. I meant to log in as demo because I'm going to be running most of my stuff as demo today, but so the numbers won't quite match up. Oh, heck, let's just, let's just make sure it's right. All right, now we're on the demo login. So uh, demo login, KC import export, and there's some of these values that I want to pull out. Now, I, I want to be able to use these in other environments. I want to be able to use them in things like um, a, a web browser. 
So here is, this is demo I'm using. This is a service I previously wrote. These are the same numbers you were just seeing for KC import export. And I can buy and sell shares in this. Uh, maybe I also, maybe I don't like that style of um, application. Oh, oh, that's the same one. Let me try this other one. Maybe I want to do a, a Swagger implementation. Same, same application, same data, um, um, same web service on the back end. Write the web service once, reuse, reuse, reuse. Or maybe I want to use an Excel spreadsheet to access my data. Again, it's just calling a, um, a web service on my host. So if I click refresh here, I just pulled back that data. I just ran 18 transactions on my host. Now, how can I run 18 transactions if I'm just getting that real-time quote? Well, it's one transaction to start trader, one transaction to end trader, and then it's four transactions or four screens that I got to walk through to get each one of the stocks. Four times four, 16 plus two, 18 transactions just to get the real-time quote of all four of my stocks. And you saw how fast it just ran. And in this service, uh, I also wrote the ability you can buy and sell shares. So I can go in here and I can also sell a thousand shares and do a refresh. You can see it drop. I could sell another thousand, sell another thousand, click refresh. There's a, I just ran 69 transactions on my host. Very, very fast response time. Very easy to use. All right, enough about front of glass. Let's start looking at code. How do I, how do I actually write code to do this. Now, we use Eclipse as our editor, and Eclipse allows us to uh, connect to the host and write our JavaScript. Uh, it's real easy to be able to communicate with the host with the HostBridge plugin down here. So I can write a piece of legitimate JavaScript like this. And I can simply right mouse click in this window and I can say execute. This piece of JavaScript was sent to the host, it was sent back checked, and it was executed, and the results of that execution was sent back to here. It was executed inside CICS. JavaScript running inside CICS. I can turn this into a deployable, a deployed uh, web service by simply doing right mouse click and make. It says, do you want to replace the hello world that's out there? I say, sure. It says, build complete. What just happened was this piece of JavaScript code was sent to the host, CICS. It was syntax checked, compiled, and saved in the host. I can now invoke that web service. It's a pretty simple web service, obviously just saying hello world. I can invoke that web service just by using a URL that goes to my host. Now, you're going to notice a lot of these URLs out here that say demo.hostbridge.com, HB script, hello world, like that one. That's a, that's a, a customer, an external facing uh, URL. You guys can actually uh, use the URLs you see today. I'm not going to highlight them very much. I might put one of the URLs in the, in the chat session so you can follow along. But uh, you'll actually be able to follow along and execute the same web services that I'm executing because it's uh, externally facing and uh, the passwords automatically uh, substituted here. Something to note while I'm talking about password before I forget, authentication, auditing, logging, none of that changes with the application. You have to have a real user ID and a real password to authenticate. Uh, CICS all supports X509 certificates as well as other types of authentication. All of that's still in place. And when I run these transactions, I'm running under the credentials that were supplied at the time the request was made. So the application is still running with a real user ID, a real password, a real person. So you can identify who's running those transactions. You can of course run it with a service ID uh, from a web server and web application server of some sort and use a common ID, but that's your choice. The application still runs exactly the same. All right, so let's start with a clean sheet. Let's, let's go down here and start with a clean sheet. Uh, we're gonna do live demo. All right, there's our clean sheet. Now, I need to be able to interact with that application on the host. I need to know what the field names are on the screen. Now, I said we interact with real field names, the field names the COBOL programmer chose when this application was written. You're not gonna know what those names were. Applications are probably older than many of your programmers that you have today. 
Well, we've got two ways of discovering those applications. We have the, our existing way, it's through Application Explorer, uh, which runs inside of Eclipse. And this has some features that, that are, don't exist in the other way I'm gonna show you. Um, the other way is in beta, but I like the look and feel of our, our new beta Application Explorer that runs in a web browser. So I'm gonna use that. So uh, this is another live URL that you could go to. And if you were to copy this information and fill it in on that, you'd be able to connect to my, uh, my transactions too. I, I'd ask you not to buy and sell stock until after the demo. But this allows me to interact with that transaction. Now, this web application loaded in my browser, and now all the communication going forward is directly from the web application in my browser to my host. There's no communication back to the web server anymore. The application is completely loaded into my browser and I'm not gonna be talking to my host. So here I've launched my application. Now this looks and feels just like the 3270 screen did before, except this was an XML conversation or actually a JSON conversation taking place between this browser and my host and HostBridge running inside of CICS. So I'm talking to HostBridge with a JSON conversation and able to reproduce exactly what this screen looks like. Now, this is just a developer's tool for learning what those field names are. So understanding the flow of how applications work. The hardest part about writing web services to the host is not JavaScript, it's not HostBridge, it's understanding how the application works. So being able to walk through the applications, get all the field names, go through the success scenarios as well as the failure scenarios. And the failure scenarios are much more important than the success scenarios. There's many more of them very often. Um, and be able to understand what those are and record and save those scenarios so that you can go back and review them later as you write your code. Generally, I have a domain expert sitting next to me. When I walk through the application explorer, they're showing me all the things that can go right and more importantly, all the things that can go wrong and how that navigation works. So I'm gonna walk through my application and you can already see that I've got the field names right here. These are the field names that are on that screen. Field names the COBOL or programmer originally chose when this application was written. Again, nothing special had to be done to get these field names, just install HostBridge in your environment. I can either mouse over the field and see whether they're out on screen or I can click on the field over here and it will, it will highlight the field on the other side. All right, so let's, it looks like we have a question. Go ahead. Yeah, James, James, we do. And so one of our attendees has asked for inbound messages, what's the architecture for workload? Thinking that he could have more than one Kix region. So yes. hopefully I got that right. Well, HostBridge is completely MRO friendly. So HostBridge can be running in one or many regions um, and can communicate across uh, uh, remote, two remote regions across M standard MRO links. So anything that you should expect to be able to do under MRO, you probably can do with HostBridge involved in the mix. Uh, so it's very common to have two or three HostBridge uh, regions running, uh, facing the outside world, accepting inbound requests and being serviced on the back end by uh, two or three or more AORs or FORs, et cetera, behind it. That's a very common scenario. Okay, so I'm gonna start navigating through my application. So let's go ahead and walk through it. Again, I can see all the screens, all my fields that I'm gonna be I'm gonna needing. And here's the screen where I'm gonna what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna write the get real-time quote portion of the web service. So I wanna get the values off the screen. Now, the things I'm gonna want is I'm gonna want the, this, this field here, demo, which is called user 41, KC import export. Now I don't have to remember these fields. There's another tab over here that actually is recording my flow as I walk through these screens. So I'm gonna go ahead and click over on it and we can see all the screens that I've walked or all the commands I put in that are host bridge commands up to this point. And I'm gonna simply double click on the fields I care about. And that adds them to my flow over here. And I'm simply gonna take this code and I'm gonna copy it. Actually, why copy it that way when I can just click my copy button there. Uh, before I finish though, I don't wanna copy it yet. Let's go ahead and navigate back out again because I wanna make sure that I get out of my application cleanly. So I'm gonna hit PF12 and I'm out. Okay, now I wanna copy this bit of code that was just a, a flow of what I walked through. Now, we, this is not code generation. We don't believe in code generation. We've, we've seen it tried to be done with applications that are screen oriented and it just is a, usually a, a failure. IBM tried it, others have tried it. It does not work very well. Um, so we believe in writing code. 
So I'm going to take this bit of code, like I just copied right there, and let's go back over to my clean sheet, and I'm going to paste that code in so I've got it. Just, it's just a starting point. Now, there's things in here that I don't need. Um, I don't need uh, cursor positioning, and I don't need a timeout. Uh, the cursor positioning is there because some applications uh, do require the cursor be at a certain location when you hit enter for certain functions to happen. So the Explorer is automatically adding the cursor position for me just in case I happen to need it. It's up to me to, to pull those things out. So when we look at this right here, we can see um, what's happening, right? HB entry trad. This is me starting the transaction. That's how I'm going to start the transaction. And once I, I type in, basically, trad uh, to the application, I'm going to press the enter key. And you'll see down here where I'm pressing PF3 key. Uh, I can also do clear or any AID key, attention, um, uh, system request. All of those are valid keys inside of CICS. And all those are possible keys that I can press as I walk through this. So this bit of code right here doesn't really do me much good because there is no .hb object. I really need to set up an HB object that allows me to interact uh, with the host bridge object. Now, most of the JavaScript engine is just standard old JavaScript engine. We had to extend it so it could talk to CICS. And we did those extensions through our own set of objects. So if I want an object here that's going to um, address and be able to talk to um, CICS, I've got to create that from the host bridge object. One of the, this is where really the secret sauce is to host bridge, being able to interact with all of those applications and all those APIs that are inside CICS. Now with that right there, I now have an HB command or HB object that I can now do sets and runs and get field values against. Um, I don't want that get field value there. That was a double click I did on the first screen. All right, so another thing that I got to get is uh, by by default, what this command, what this says right here, it says hit the enter key and check to make sure that I'm on the right screen. This is actually the screen, the BMS map name for that application. Now we can see that over here in a couple places. Let me get back in, into Trader. Down here at the bottom, this is the, I know this is small, you can see my mouse, I hope. This trad BMS, that's the map set, and T002, that's the map name. So I know the map and map, map, map set and map name I'm on. I can check that inside my code to make sure I'm flowing through the screens that I expect to, expect to flow through. Remember, we don't change the application or how the application works. We're putting just a new interface on it. But we can know which screens we are as we navigate through them and make sure that we stay on the screens we expect to be on. Or if we don't, we throw an error and deal with that error. OK, back to my code. OK. but. This right here actually isn't part of the HB object by default. Um, I wrote additional code and I put it in a library that I can use anytime uh, I choose to. It, to get access to that library, all I gotta do is just require it in. So I'm gonna say var common equals new. By the way, if I stop typing or stop talking while typing, that's because I can't do both at the same time very well. And I actually got to use the right command here. OK, with that statement right there, I've just pulled in the common library of functions that I previously written. You can write your own library of functions to use over and over again. If you have certain formats that you want the data to appear in, you want to do certain checks as you write your uh, as you write your services, whatever it might be, you can write your own library of services and then reuse them over and over and over again. Uh, common as well as debugging are distributed with Housebridge. Uh, we maintain those. But you can copy that code and rewrite it, change it, make it your own, and then give it a new name and put it out there. And then you've got your own versions of these libraries. Uh, it's all JavaScript. And JavaScript, anybody can look at, view, manipulate, change, however you see fit for your needs. OK. So now we've got uh, these, these libraries in, but now we've got to actually use them. There's two things I want to do with these. One was I want to enable the ability to check what screen I'm on, which is this right here. 
So I'm going to say common.hb run. And with that command, it modifies the hb run. So every time hb run is executed, it's now going to do a host new series of checks, checks that I think are important when I write my services. But they're optional. You could, again, either write your own or not use any at all. The other thing I want to do is I want to uh, be able to turn debugging on and off in my script. Okay, so with that, I'll be able to turn debugging on and off, and I'm going to add one more statement right here. I'm going to hard code debugging on right now uh, for purposes of our writing of our code. With that, debugging is hard coded on. We'll take that out uh, later when we write this. Okay, so now I've got the ability to uh, call my host bridge object. I've got the ability, and I've got all this code here. Well, let's test out and see if it's actually doing anything. Uh, let's run this, but I got to output something. So let's output this right here. We'll output my username. Add a parenthesis at the end. Okay, I think that's well formed. Um, yeah, let's run it and see what happens. What could go wrong? Okay, there, user demo. Excellent. Let's just let's do just double check one more thing. Let's get the uh, share now. Uh, no, let's get value, total value. And execute this. Okay, so let's go back over and check that. 35, 367. Let's go back over here. Look at that. Okay, so I just wrote JavaScript that's accessing values out of um, a 3270 screen, out of a, um, a BMS application. All right, we got to get, we got to continue. We don't have much time to get our web service done in the time we've got allotted. So, all right, so I've proven that we can navigate in, get the data. Oh, let's double check and see what happens if I put in a bad um, screen name and let's see what, what happens when I do that, just to be sure. <clears throat> yep, expected map T00A, because I say I expected to tap map 00, but receive map T002. So it's throwing errors like it's supposed to. So let's put that back. All right. so. I've already navigated in and grabbed a piece of data on my screen, written it out and got back out again. But now we've got to turn this into a callable web service. Now we've got to do some real work. Uh, let's see, what do we want to do first? Let's turn this into a function because right now I've hard coded the company number right here. I want to be able to call a function and pass in the company number so I can get any of the company numbers that I want. So let's create a function first. In fact, let's create several functions. Let's create an initialization, a termination, and a, a main, and a get, get quote. So let's, let's do um, initialization. And in my initialization, I'm going to take this stuff where I start my transaction and get it going. Later on, I'll also grab my input that is coming in from the outside world that says what company I want to get the uh, quote for. I'll, I'll, I'll do that in initialization as well, but we'll save that for later. Uh, termination. By the way, these functions are not required. It's entirely up to you to, to design and write your services in the way that makes sense to you. This is just how I do it. Uh, none of these things are required. It's JavaScript. Do whatever you like, whatever works. And in termination, I want to uh, exit um, my uh, transaction. So the only thing I need to do to exit my transaction from any screen is hit PF12. Uh, but I also want to do one more thing that I haven't talked about. So when HostBridge is running, it sets up a, a, a very tiny amount of resources inside the application as we walk through. We want to make sure we clean up that session resources. Now, they'll time out automatically after five minutes and disappear on their own, but we don't want them to hang around for five minutes. We have customers that are running 20 million transactions a day through HostBridge, and in a, in a five-minute period of time, that might be... Um, tens of thousands of uh, services that have been called. We don't want to leave source, uh, resources hanging around for five minutes uh, uh, with those because of the number of invocations are being done. So I'm going to say 
With that, House Bridge is out of the system. There is nothing left. So we're going to make a call in. We execute our, 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 our business process. We exit back out. No trace is left on the host other than audit, logging, of course, security stuff. But uh, as far as there's no remainder of House Bridge running, no remainder of the transaction running. All right. So there's a termination. I'll add more to that too. Well, that's where we'll do our output later on. Now let's do our get quote function. This is where the meat of where our work's going to happen at. We're going to pass in company number, and that'd be that'd be all of this code down to here. So let's just examine this code one more time before I finish it. The, um, we're already our transactions already started because uh, initialization is going to be the first thing that gets called. Uh, so we're already in flight. And then I'm, I'm gonna put my company number in here. So let's get rid of this. I'm gonna press enter after putting the company number in. Then I'm gonna pick option one. That's our middle screen over here in the application. So over here, that's this screen. I'm gonna pick option one, which is get real time quote. And I didn't even have to, I didn't even have to remember what the field name was uh, because I was just used that code flow to do it, but it's called op two. And then uh, after that, I'm, I press the enter key and I'm on the screen that has all the values on the screen that I wanna extract out and do something with. And then I'm gonna press the PF3 key and I'm gonna press the PF3 key twice. So there's the P uh, that gets me back to the initial screen where, is where I put in my company number. So in good quote, I'm gonna navigate, uh, I wanna start with that initial screen that lists all the companies. I'm going to navigate in, get the quote, and navigate back to that same screen so that I, if I choose to, I can choose another company to select more. So the intention is not to get just one quote at a time, but maybe I want to get two, three, or even all four stocks uh, at a time, and I'll just list those in my input. That way, I don't have to exit the transaction and get back in for each individual uh, company I want to get a quote for. Okay, so with this right here, I got my navigation in and my navigation out, but I'm not really doing anything with the data values. I got to store them somewhere. Uh, before we do that, let's go ahead and get our main program written so that we can um, invoke all of these things for our testing. And so it's going to be initialization. Um, I know I'm going to call get quote. Got to probably probably receive something back from that. And right now I'm just going to hard code a one. We'll fix that too later. Then termination at the end. All right. So that's our main. But now we got to kick the whole process off by actually calling main like that. Okay. So this is back to a callable. This should be a callable routine again. Let's see what happens when we run this. Let's see if it executes for us. It does. We're back to an executable, uh, um, um, executable service. All right. We need to do something with this output because we want this output to be returned as part of our web service. Now, that means either JSON or XML or some other format that, that your company might want to put things in. So it doesn't matter to us. We're agnostic as to what the output looks like. Um, so we got to save these values off and return them. What do we want our output to look like? Well, okay. So right here, I know I want to return a quote. This is get quote. So I'm going to say return quote. Okay, that's the value I'm going to send back. Now we have to fill in quote. What do I want quote to look like? Var quote equals. I'm going to turn it, I'm going to create a JavaScript object. And that's just a way of having uh, that you can have properties and values. Uh, as part of a larger structure. Uh, think of it as just a data structure, more or less. So I want to say user, and then I want to get this value right here. Okay, so now that's going to have user in it. I might as well just do the rest of these. Let me just cut and paste. Okay, four or five, comp 41. This um, count 41 was the company name held is the number of shares held. I'm just going to call that shares. And value is the total value of those shares.
And lastly, share now is the current share price. Okay. Okay, with that, I should be returning quote back to my calling program here. And so I need to accept my quote. Now, where am I gonna put, I've still gotta put this data someplace. Let's create a template of where, of what my return data is gonna look like. And I'm gonna do it up here in the global space. So I wanna have obviously a list of quotes. So I'm gonna declare that as an array. That's the first thing I want. But I also wanna have information about how my service is running. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna create a status block in here that tells me how things are going. What do I wanna know about uh, my service? I wanna know how long it took to run. To run. Now this is gonna be just the host time. How long was it on the host? Now it's not CPU time, it's actually elapsed time. I want to know how many transactions I ran. Uh, did it run successfully? And I'm going to set it to false initially. Um, and if I didn't, what are my, what were my errors? And since I feel like I can have more than one error at any point in time, I'm going to make that an array as well. Uh, so quotes is going to have an array of quotes. Um, elapsed time, yep. Okay, so for the elapsed time, I gotta start a clock timer of some sort. I'm gonna go up here and create a variable called start time. And we had to create a uh, object to get uh, time in uh, microseconds because milliseconds was not accurate enough when we were running large scale uh, in, uh, integrations, um, we need to know down to the microsecond uh, how things are running. So stick F actually is a, an assembler command. Um, it gets the clock. Uh, we wrapped an assembler plan to get the clock time uh, all the way down to microseconds. All right, stick F, uh, start time, elapsed time. Okay, so the clock has started. So in my termination, I need to stop my clock and I need to set my elapsed time. So the way I set a value for the response here is going to be response.status.elapsed time. So response status dot time equals um, the new time is bigger than the old time. So I'm going to put my stick F in the front. Start time. All right, so that's, that's going to set my uh, start time into there. Let's, since we're in termination, I know we're hopping around, but since we're in termination, let's go ahead and get our output. Let's go ahead and produce our output in termination. Uh, we also need our tran count. And I can get that out of the HB object because it counts how many transactions I'm actually, I've actually run. And now we need to pr produce our output. Um, let's just do JSON for right now. W because I'm producing my output in one spot, I can actually change what my output looks like and make it JSON or XML and make that decision at the very end. Right now, we're just going to code um, JSON. I'm going to say I want JSON headers, and I'm going to do a write. I don't, do a, I don't want to do a write line because I don't want a, a line feed at the end. And you can see I'm using a function out of a method out of my uh, common routines. Okay, so with this, it should produce JSON output at the end. All right, oh, we should test this. Uh, let's see, termination, elapsed time, trend count, uh, JSON. Boy, it looks okay to me. Well, let's run it and see what happens. What did you wrong? Execute. Ooh, I got Jason. Now it doesn't have any quotes. And there's my elapsed time, number of transactions I executed. I haven't updated my false yet and no errors. All right, so let's go in and let's add our quotes. That's gonna be easy to do, right? All I gotta do here is say um, response dot quote quotes. If I could spell quotes. 
dot push. Push is a method uh, for an array. So I'm going to push the quote onto my array, onto my array here of quotes. Okay, so when I run this again, I should have my first quote in here. So let's just execute again. And we do. User demo, company, case import shares, total value. Uh, it's hidden behind my, my Zoom control scroller. Oh, it looks good. Looking good. All right. So let's go ahead and uh, continue on. We're going to have to do more than just one quote. We'll, we'll fix that in a bit. What else do we need to do here? Uh, we should probably uh, put some protection in here. So if things go wrong, if I should get an error someplace in my code, or let's say um, I end up on a wrong screen, that I still return valid output. So I'm gonna wrap, wrapper this whole uh, area in a try catch, because I want this to be a production ready service. So I'm gonna put my, put my try catch here. It's going to put any errors in E, and then we'll deal with our error there. And then we're going to have a finally section, which is a JavaScript way of saying, even if I have an error, I always want you to do this section. So we're going to move termination up into my finally section. Okay, so what are we going to do with my errors? Well, I just need to uh, push my errors onto um, my error stack and my response. So response dot uh, status dot, is that right? Uh, no, that's not right. Response dot status dot errors, is that right? Let's go look up here again. Response dot status dot errors, yep, that's right. So I'm gonna go down here and say response dot status dot errors dot push E, that's it. So now if an error occurs, it's gonna push it on the stack. And if I don't get an error by the time I get to here, then this has been a success. So I'm gonna say response.status true. Hate when I type silly things. All right, let's run it again. Let's see what happens. Okay, it still runs, but what happens if I create an error? So I'm gonna create an error right here by putting a bad one in. Let's see what it does. And it did blow out. And let's see if I can oh, get this out of the way again. Expected map T00, but received map 003, bad map. So it threw the error. All right, cool. Let's, let's fix my code again, T003. All right. Wow, we're flying. Um, okay. So what next? Let's see, how about we go ahead and get our input from the outside world. Instead of hard coding it, that input, let's, let's pass that input in from the outside world. Okay, so this is the first time we've had an interaction with the outside world. And after we make this change, we won't be able to make our, do our tests inside the test harness anymore. We'll need to, or inside a, a, a Eclipse anymore. We'll need to test from the outside world. Now I can test, <clears throat> I can test using Postman or a web browser or different ways. I'm probably just gonna use a web browser for today. Um, but you can test using standard testing tools for, for doing web services like Postman. Uh, in fact, I have Postman loaded, and if we have time, I'll show you that as well. All right, so let's get our input up here under initialization. So even before I start my transaction, let's get our input. Okay, I'm going to create a variable called input, and at the end, I'm going to return input like that. And to get my output, or to get uh, parameters passed in, I can get them from a, a posted document in JSON or XML. But for today, for ease of use, I'm just going to use a URL query string for my input. So I'm going to just get companies. And the way I get that is by another HB object. So what this says is, I want you to, uh, off the URL query string, I want you to look for a parameter called companies, and I want you to pull that in. But now I want to be able to pass in more than one company at a time. So I'm going to separate my company numbers with commas. And I want to go ahead and split that out into an array. So I'm going to use a JavaScript function called split. 
And I'm going to split that uh, on a commas. One other thing I want to pass in, I want to say whether I want this to be XML output or JSON output. So we'll accept, we'll, we'll either, we can produce either type of output. We'll do that at the very end in the termination section. And we'll just call that type. Um, so I'm going to say, if it's not equal, equal to XML, in other words, unless they explicitly say they want XML, I'm going to set it, um, I'm going to set it to JSON. And if they do say they want XML, then I'll set it to XML. So if it's not equal to XML, it's going to be JSON. Otherwise, it's XML. It's not X. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So far, so good. So now I've got my input. I'm returning my input down here where I'm calling my initialization. I need to save my input. Okay. So now I've got my input. And input has a, a value called companies, which is an array. So I need to iterate over that array to get all my companies. And I should be using let instead of var for all these things. So if you JavaScripters are out there, I apologize. Um, input companies.length. So I'm going to iterate over how many of there are in the companies array. Uh, I plus plus and our loop is going to just include just this one thing. And so inside here, I need to change this to say um, input.companies square bracket i. And I'm going to make sure this is a string. Oh, it is a string. It's automatically a string. I don't have to worry about that. All right. Wow. Uh, OK, I can no longer test this by doing a right mouse click because now it's expecting input from the outside world. So now I need to test this by actually making this and saving it on the host and then testing it from a browser. So I'm going to say make. Uh oh, I've got an error. I made a mistake here somewhere. This is not supposed to be a semicolon. It's inside of an object. So I got to just remove that. Try and make it again. Ooh, it made. You know what? I changed my mind. We're going to use Postman. I've already got it set up. So here's demo hostbridge.com, HP script live demo. I'm going to pass in just one value for companies. And let's send that and see what happens. Uh oh, look out. I think I got data. Get this out of the way. Oh, I still. I ended up on the wrong map here. So probably when I was changing one of those around, I messed up and changed it, didn't change it back to the value it was supposed to be. Expected map T003, the received map T002. And that was on line 74. I think it's 74 is where I got to go look. Let's just go back over to 74. Oh, 74, and I got to go up one from it because that was where it was called from. 74, 50. So I go up to 50. Oh, this should have been T002. That's what it said, isn't it? That doesn't seem right. Let's run that again. Oh, we're going downhill. Things are getting worse. <laughs> Let's see. Let's see here. Oh, I can't run it. I can't run it interactively. I keep forgetting I can't run it interactively. I can't run it from, from here anymore. Uh, I got to do a make. And I got to test it from here. Expected map T002, but three step 003. So I think I got the wrong change there. So let's change this back to T003 and run this again. Make, execute. Oh. Wrong, wrong, wrong place. Execute. Fifty. Okay. Expected map T zero zero three, but received map map T zero zero two. Except expected maps T zero zero three, but it's received map T zero zero two. I'm making some basic mistake here that I wasn't making a second ago, and I can't see it in front of me. So when I get out, I'm hitting PF3. Oh, 
I've got an idea. Let's use our debugging, which we haven't used yet. So let me make sure I've got the last one here. Let's see what's happening. So when I turn debug on, what happened is, is all the outputs being written out to the um, uh, a TS queue that I can retrieve dynamically uh, through this tooling that I've got here. So I can actually see where I'm walking through, what screens I'm walking through. So I'm going in, I'm navigating in uh, one, two, three, and then I'm backing out, backing out to here. And then I'm blowing out right here. Received expect, expected map T003, but received TMAP002. You must select a company. Oh, my values aren't getting populated in for my selection. It did the first one, but it didn't do the second one. Oh, there is no second one. There's only one in the list. So I'm doing something wrong in how I'm getting my values out. We're almost out of time. I got to go fast. Um, let's see. So it's got to be, it's, it has, it's related to how I'm doing my input. So if I put two, three, four in here and I do a send, I'm getting all four, but then I'm getting an error after I do them. So I've got a, some sort of minor error where I'm hitting enter again, where I'm not supposed to be. I'm going in and running it one too many times. Input companies link start with zero. Input companies, oh, oh, no, that's right. Input companies I. Somebody online, somebody in this out there probably sees what I'm doing wrong. It's something real simple. It's in my loop right here. Because when I'm iterating through, I'm getting all the values. Well, let's out, let's write the values out. We'll go over here and on my input, after my input, I'm gonna say, let's make sure that I'm getting what I think I'm getting. Let's do another make, oh, not execute, make. We'll go back over and run this again here. It's going to get the error still. And let's go back and look at our debug output again. Refresh it, get the latest debug. And let's go to the top. And so it is passing in what I expect to pass in, one, two, three, four. I've just got a silly, some sort of silliness in my loop that I'm not seeing in front of my eyes. Always the danger of doing a live demo. Okay. We are really, really close to finishing this out. I've only got three minutes left. I want to make sure that we get, uh, we, add, we uh, answer any questions. So Jerry, go ahead and interrupt me while I interrupt me and ask sure. me a question while I, yeah. while I look for answer here. Well, first I'll tell everyone, uh, James he has so many years of experience. There's no question he'd be able to figure out where this error is given enough time. And, but, but let me just tee a couple things up. So a couple questions that have come in. Uh, one of them was, is this solution able to handle outbound messages? Is what you're showing able to handle outbound messages? Yes. I figured that was the right short answer, but I wanted them to hear it from you. Uh, another question here is, uh, I know the answer to this, but I want you, you to provide it. So uh, the things that you're showing us here with respect to APIs, it is true, isn't it, that there are no changes required at the application level to make this work? No changes application whatsoever. And here's my error, guys. While I is less than one, or why I, while input companies, uh, that was so silly of me. That was all it was. It's just I forgot to do that. So let's, let, let's, I knew it had to be something silly, and it was. Okay, so it ran to the end. I've got a success. It tells me the number of transactions I executed, the, the, the time I executed, and there they all are. And in fact, uh, I don't have a check in there for uh, extra ones. So I've got a sample here. So I, when I click this one, it's going to get quotes for the same thing over and over again, but it's still going to run through a lot of transactions. And so when I execute that, I'm running 160 transactions, I think, something like that. Let's go to the bottom and see how many transactions I just ran. I ran 162 transactions and I did that in two seconds, which actually is kind of slow. Oh, debugging is turned on. Let me turn debugging off and we'll, we'll fix the performance. So as James is doing that, uh, and let me just see if anyone else has a question. James has covered a lot of ground in this demo today. And if anyone is watching this and saying, I'm not sure how I could do this, I have great news for you is if you work with us, this is not a do-it-yourself proposition. 
This is a host bridge will partner with you proposition. We will come alongside you. You get all the expertise of James and his technical services team to help you figure out exactly how to do what James is showing you in your environment and with your applications. And most of the time we work with customers mm -hmm. before they ever license HostBridge to do a complete prototype so you can see how it works and how fast it is and, and have complete confidence in what you're gonna get when you do what James has shown you today to make your CICS applications available via an API or service. So James, there was, I think, something you were gonna tell us about turning debugging off. It looks like it got a lot faster. Yeah, I, I ran 162 transactions in about a second. Remember, this is not a, a Z15 big box. This is a less than a hundred MIP box. So we're running on a very small box, very, very fast. And by the way, all of HostBridge's work is zip eligible. That means if you've got a zip um, a processor on your system, all of the JavaScript will run on the zip. Your application code, of course, has to run on the GP, but our code can run on the zip. So none of this orchestration, none of this manipulation costs you anything extra in CPU. So if there are any other questions, we'd love to have you send them in on the chat. Or if afterwards you think of a question, you can reach us simply by sending email to info at hostbridge. Com. I will put that in the chat. Um, if you have other questions, please let us know. We would love to work with you to let you try this with your applications on your systems. It's a very simple process. And as I said, you get the expertise of James and our entire team if you want to see how this works for you. So let me see if anyone else has a question or a comment. Has this been helpful? We would like to know if you wanna share that with us. We'd love your feedback on what you've seen here today. James, any parting comments before we turn everyone loose? I just wanna do the XML one because I wanna show them that we can do with a switch. We can do, I want with a switch, we can do JSON or XML. Uh, oh, I got to pass in the input quick, James, before we run out of time. Make it and test it one more time. So I send it. And this is Jason. And let's add type XML. Let's just do only four companies. And now it's XML. Just by changing a switch on the fly when you make the request. With so that, what, guys, I apologize. I ran a little longer than I normally do. I guess I was talk too much and a little slow. Well, we hope it was helpful. Uh, I do want to say that, yes, you did see a lot of coding today, but the benefits of the approach that James has shown you is it is lightning fast in terms of response time. It is highly resilient. There is no brittleness that's associated with using screen scraping to do integration work. And of course, we have all the expertise to help you get going with this. We would love to talk to you. I do want to confirm that we have recorded this session. And I hope by the end of the week, I'll get an email out to all who registered with the link. And if you have any questions, uh, we want to hear them. One last question before we go. We have two minutes left. So the question is this. HostBridge handles the gateway from distributed to kicks as to how the API gets to the mainframe. James, is that right? Can you confirm that? Uh, yeah. I... So uh, the, the path is uh, it, a request comes from the outside world. It hits CICS first where authentication is taking place before anything is looked at in the data. So uh, CICS, IBM, RECF, or ACF2 authenticates us. Then it starts us, HostBridge. We're able to get the input and read it in whatever form it is. So the API that you choose to use is entirely in your control. You could use comma delimited. You could use uh, binary. It's up to you to decide how, what you want the input to look like. Um, and then HostBridge receives that data, processes that data, and can return it in whatever form you would like, whether that be XML, JSON, doesn't matter. There's no pipelining. There's no bundles. There's no this big process you have to do to make this work. What you saw me do right here, I could go into a customer site and do immediately after HostBridge is installed. There's, 
there's none of that big heavy overhead of having to do bundles and pipelines and 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 very strict APIs. You decide what the API looks like entirely in your control. I hope that answers that question. We appreciate all your questions and send us more. As I mentioned, our way to reach us, email is info at hostbridge.com. We're going to let you go now, but thanks everyone for your time and attention today. We would love to work with you. Let us know how we can help.